on this Tuesday night. You can murder somebody and end up in a healing lodge, which is better than a rehab. His daughter's killer was serving a prison sentence in a healing lodge. Turns out, other convicted child murderers are too. A CBC News exclusive. Excited to vote, finally. Calgarians finally get their say. Should the city bid for the games? With fewer cities willing to host, we ask, where does that leave the Olympics? He risked his life for us. So for me, that it's not acceptable. And why a decorated war vet was turned away from a veteran's hospital, even though there are plenty of empty beds. This is The National. The brazen kidnapping of eight-year-old Tori Stafford made headlines across the country a decade ago. But the revelation this fall that one of her killers, Terry Lynn McClintock, had been transferred to an Indigenous healing lodge, that sparked outrage and demands that she go back behind bars. Now, CBC News has learned this wasn't an isolated case. In fact, more than 20 other child killers have been moved to Indigenous healing lodges over the past seven years. Power and Politics host Vashi Capellos is breaking this story for us tonight. A living hell. The pain of losing his daughter Tori was unmistakable, and Rodney Stafford wanted Tori's killers to pay. I just want any, anybody responsible for what has happened to make sure they get their dues. So when he found out one of the people convicted of his daughter's murder was transferred from prison to a healing lodge, Stafford didn't hold back. There's no deterrent to stop them from, from doing it. Like, you can murder somebody and end up in a healing lodge. But CBC News has learned Terry Lynn McClintock's transfer isn't an isolated event, far from it. She's one of 22 people convicted of the first or second degree murder of a child under 18 who have been transferred to a healing lodge. And not just under this Liberal government, at least 10 transfers happened under the previous Harper Conservatives too. They had 10 years to fix it, and they didn't. Which ones? I, I, I don't have the names, but... I mean, uh, I mean but to say that, you, you, you do need some evidence, yeah, right? Like, yeah, but, but, there, but again, there were those kind of transfers that did take place. The new numbers come after six weeks of intense political back and forth over McClintock's transfer. A party of ambulance-chasing politicians. At least the Prime Minister can show some kind of emotion, even though it's self-righteous. Conservatives criticized the government for allowing McClintock's transfer and not reversing it fast enough. But on the only now just revealed fact their party also oversaw transfers when in government, a spokesperson said the details of those cases are unknown and insisted our conservative government acted swiftly whenever these types of bad decisions in the criminal justice system became known, as when we ended old age security benefits for Clifford Olson. Hmm. So, Vashi, what do we know about the 22 people that have been moved from traditional prisons to these healing lodges? Hi, Andrew. Well, I'll start with what we know, but I'll preface that by saying there's a lot more that we don't know. On what we do know is that this group of people, they have all committed a murder of a child. The group is comprised of men and women. They're, according to Public Safety Canada, are two healing lodges for women in the country, seven for men. What we don't know is the particular circumstances of any of these cases, for example, the crimes they committed, the sentences they're serving. All that information is kept private and only the victim's families are privy to it. But, I mean, all the public and political blowback that we've seen, it's forced the government to review the entire process, right? Yeah, at first the Liberals said we can't do anything about Terry Lynn McClintock's clinics, I'm sorry, specific case. So instead they're reviewing, or they did review, the entire system. And last week they came out with new, tighter rules, rules that essentially prompted uh, Terry Lynn McClintock to be transferred back to prison away from the healing lodge. And I know you'll be talking about this as well, but the government does stress that these healing lodges have a record of successfully dealing with difficult cases and can be the right approach for certain offenders, depending, though, on the case. Andrew? Okay. Vashi Capellos, host of CBC's Power and Politics. Thanks, Vashi. You're welcome. And, and, and yeah, Vashi's right. There, there can be advantages to the healing lodge approach. There are also those who disagree, people who see them as amounting to a free pass for convicted murderers, as we saw. But let's talk about what actually goes on inside a healing lodge and who qualifies for a transfer. Indigenous healing lodges are intended to address the high rate of Indigenous people behind bars and concerns that traditional prison programs don't work well for them. 
first created in the 90s. There are now nine such healing lodges across the country, most in the prairies. Corrections Canada says services and programs for offenders use a holistic and spiritual approach, incorporating Indigenous values, traditions, and beliefs. Elders play a critical role in these spiritual lodges, holding ceremonies and teaching. Offenders learn Indigenous languages and are taught how to live independently for when they get out. And these minimum and medium security facilities aren't limited to Indigenous inmates either. Others are free to apply if they accept the Indigenous programming and spirituality. Corrections Canada says before moving an offender to a healing lodge, it does weigh the risk to public safety. Last year, the Auditor General found that healing lodges are at almost full capacity and there aren't enough of them across the country. Building new ones was also a recommendation coming out of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. But since those reports were released, no new lodges have been built. To Halifax now, where a teacher has been arrested after a physical confrontation with a student. And it turns out this is not his first brush with the law. All Canadian teachers go through a criminal check as part of their certification or when they're first hired, but after that, standards vary. Unlike school volunteers who have to undergo police checks regularly, it's often the teacher's responsibility to flag their own legal issues. As Tom Murphy tells us, now there are calls for change. This is what led to the teacher's arrest. What you're seeing is the tail end of a video captured in a Halifax classroom by another student. Some sort of altercation after the teacher removed earbuds from a 15-year-old's ears, according to the RCMP. I saw the this where, is the teacher in question, days. seen in an I earlier interview. He's Derek William Stevenson. Back in 2010, a woman had a protection order against Stevenson. Three years later, he pleaded guilty to assaulting his wife, and then in 2017, Stevenson pleaded guilty to threatening his then-girlfriend. A school administrator had vouched for him at least once. The issue is, how widely was this teacher's past known? How widely should it be known? We were definitely not aware of it. It still would have been nice to have been aware um, as a board, so that it was just something that we could keep an eye on. In Stevenson's case, he was convicted twice but received conditional discharges. Convictions would have been there, but, but uh, technically there would have been no criminal record, yeah. And in Halifax, at least, if an employed teacher doesn't disclose, no one necessarily has to know. Halifax Regional Centre for Education says teachers get a criminal check before they are hired, but the onus is on them to report if they subsequently get in trouble with the law after that. It's similar in Ontario, Winnipeg and Montreal, and none of them do criminal checks after a teacher is hired. The world star. Nova Scotia is now reviewing its policies. His school has placed Stevenson on administrative leave, and while he's not talking to the media, tonight he has relinquished his teacher's license and will appear in court next month. Tom Murphy, CBC News, Halifax. At 91 years old, Gordon Smith figured he'd be living in a home for veterans by now. His years of service long behind him, having spent time in the Royal Canadian Air Force and before that with the British Navy in the Second World War. But Smith is being denied access to care at a veterans hospital in Nova Scotia, even though there are open beds. Kayla Hounsell explains why. This one is the war medal. Having Gordon Smith wears his medals with pride. When he was 14, he volunteered with Britain's Civil Defence Corps, carrying stretchers bearing the dead and wounded. Three years later, he decided he wanted to do more. I heard the siren sound, and then shortly afterwards, I heard this plane noise. It was what they called a V-1. Um, that is a, a, a flying bomb. It was a V-1 because it was a vengeance weapon um, that Hitler wanted to use against the civilian population. It exploded near his home, damaging it badly. I went later to a recruiting office and, went, and I said, I want to join the Royal Navy. He sailed the North Sea searching for debris and bodies and was on guard on VE Day. After the war, he immigrated to Canada and served in the Royal Canadian Air Force for nearly two decades. He then volunteered for another 20 years with the Royal Canadian Legion, visiting veterans in long-term care, where he's always thought he would end up himself. And it's the comradeship. Uh, it's the fact that um, uh, 
You'll be talking to people who have had similar experiences. They're completely um, disqualifying him on the fact that he wasn't with the Canadian forces at the time. Smith's granddaughter says Veterans Affairs has told her family he won't be given a bed at Halifax's Camp Hill Veterans Memorial because the majority of beds at that facility are for war veterans and Smith's service during wartime wasn't with the Canadian forces but rather an allied force. 29 beds are currently empty. He risked his life for us. So for me, that it's not acceptable. There are some beds set aside for veterans who served with allied forces, but there are none available, and there's a wait list. Now 91, Smith's health is declining uh, that, and his mobility uh, decreasing. Which is most important to you? I'd have to say the uh, defense medal. Why? I think it was more touching. Uh, I carried so many injured and dead. It stays with me. All he wants is to finish his days in a place he feels comfortable with his comrades. Okay. <laughs> Kayla Hounsel, CBC News, Hubbards, Nova Scotia. We're live on the Pacific edition of The National with developing news from Calgary where residents have voted against their city bidding for the 2026 Winter Olympic Games. <laughs> And so they were celebrating uh, where the no supporters gathered. 56% of Calgarians voting against hosting, 43% in favor. More than 304,000 ballots were cast. That's a pretty big turnout. The official results will be certified by Friday. Our Carolyn Dunn has reaction tonight from the Yes campaign party. Well, you know, they were trying to put on a brave face, calling for unity, uh, <clears throat> thanking the thousands of volunteers who came out, especially in the last few days, to really try and get out the yes vote. But obviously, the mood here is deflated. There are people who really invested in this campaign. And uh, today, they were disappointed by 6%. I'm here with Kyle Schufeld, who is a three-time Olympian and medal gold medalist. Kyle, tell me about what that felt like to hear the bad news from your perspective. It's gut-wrenching. I, I have a pit in my stomach right now. I'm, I'm highly disappointed that the city, the citizens of the city made that decision. I thought this was a great bid. I thought it was a responsible bid. It was a sustainable bid. It would have been, made our city more accessible with the Paralympic Games being here. There was a lot of elements to it, to me, that made sense, and it was an energy that could move the city forward. So the question that I'm asking myself now is, okay, if 56% of Calgarians don't want this, then what do they want? What are they willing to stand up for so we can move this city forward in a positive direction? Uh, what do you think spoke to the no side to get them out in those numbers? I'm asking myself that question and I don't have an answer. I think I got really mixed messaging throughout it. I think the security costs were a big thing that came up. The IOC corruption was a big thing. Doping was a big thing and people just, didn't want to spend money, they couldn't see the vision of the importance of the Olympic Games. Calgary 88 was a magical thing for this city and I don't think people could see what it could do for us. When I looked at this, I thought of 2056, what could this do for this city? And I thought that it could propel us in a new direction. So I'm feeling very disappointed here tonight. Okay, well thanks for joining us even though it is a, a tough day. Kyle Schufeld, such a, an extraordinary Canadian Olympian. It gives you a sense, Carolyn, and gives our audience a sense of the kind of motion there was, certainly for the yes side, but the no has prevailed. Not a legally binding vote, though, Carolyn, and now it's up to Calgary City Council to try to figure out what to do next. That's right. City Council will vote to, you know, basically uh, confirm this. They're not legally required to vote one way or the other. So I guess what we're going to have to wait and see is whether the uh, councillors who have voted yes in the past are going to switch their vote to no now that 56% of those who voted uh, have spoken in that favour. And that's a, you know, there's some political risk involved in for councillors to go against uh, the citizens of the city. And so we are going to be watching that as it goes forward in the next few days. And what we certainly know is that there was a large turnout. All the points of view were certainly expressed in the debate leading up to this. And just yeah. to review again the numbers Absolutely. from the city, 56.4% voting no, 43% uh, voting yes. Carolyn Dunn in Calgary, thank you very much for the update. 
So this is not, as Carolyn pointed out, a legally binding decision. If Calgary still decides to go ahead with its bid for 2026, which would be, as she points out, legally fraught, it would likely only face two others. Stockholm also putting forward a strong bid, but it doesn't have government support. Sweden, a country known for winter sports and a country that's never hosted the Games. The other finalist is a combined Italian bid of Milan and the northern alpine region of Cortino d'Ampezzo. Italy has hosted both the Summer and Winter Games before, so like Calgary, there is some sports infrastructure there, but the country is also facing financial issues, and there's no government money backing the bid. So the IOC generally is facing a problem. Cities around the world are not clamoring to host the Olympics. Vancouver. <laughs> Gone are the days of this fierce competition between many countries to win the Olympic Games. For the 2026 bid alone, Japan and Switzerland both dropped out. And the residents of Innsbruck, Austria, which like Calgary has hosted the Games before, let the public decide and it was an overwhelming no, all of which puts the IOC on offense. It's called the new norm, a commitment. Now we're seeing ads like this, trying to assure cities that the benefits of the Olympics outweigh the costs. But an expert who studies Olympic costs says that simply isn't true. The IOC gets most of the benefits, if not all of the benefits, and the cities uh, have to shoulder most of the costs. Still, with the Olympics comes recognition. It is one of the most watched events in the world, but that too can have a downside. Rio did not uh, end the Olympic Games covered in glory. Being in the global eye for two weeks also comes with costs. So where do the games go? There's always authoritarian regimes. Uh, there's always cities that are desperate for global recognition. Which leaves the IOC in a tough spot. Take the games to countries which don't have to justify the multi-billion dollar price tag or stick with cities which have hosted before and have the infrastructure. But as we're seeing with Calgary, it is not an easy sell. And of course, this Calgary vote, as we've mentioned, not legally binding, but politically, well, that's a different story. And we'll hear from Mayor Nenshi later on in the hour. We're also watching a major emergency still developing south of the border, California, dealing with its most deadly and destructive wildfire in history. Huh. It's all gone. It's all gone. This is paradise, ravaged by the so-called campfire in Northern California. Tonight, an update, 48 people confirmed dead in this fire alone, more than 200 still missing. Mobile DNA labs and cadaver dogs are going through burnt out cars and the rubble of homes. So far, the fire only 30% contained and no significant rain in the forecast. And there's more devastation in the state's south. Here's a look at the Woolsey fire, which is tearing through the Malibu area north of Los Angeles. This fire flaring up again today, but these helicopter shots from this hour, you can see the intense flames. Some areas, uh, but not this one, of course, have been reopened to local residents. My wedding uh, invitation. Neighborhoods like this one turn to ash around Malibu. This is the remnants of a fire which we are just seeing has claimed uh, two lives and hundreds of homes. The blaze flaring up again today. And ahead tonight on The National, it was a medical breakthrough developed right here in Canada, a prescription drug used to treat a rare disease. So then why was it only ever sold once? We go in depth to find out. And a little later, do you know your employer's policy when it comes to marijuana? Nearly a month after legalization, David Common tries to clear the air. First, though, the Canadian company hoping to succeed where Google, Microsoft and Sony have all struggled. Diane Buckner takes us inside. I'm going to just simulate you getting some, some messages here. Oh, text show up right from your phone. I'm reading from my glasses here. Okay, Glass, take a picture. They've been criticized for being expensive, unattractive, even creepy. Many companies have tried to promote smart glasses, which display information and can record images, but so far none has really caught on with consumers. 
but a small Ontario company is hoping to change that. North opened its first retail store in Toronto today. And the CBC's Diane Buckner was there to find out whether their smart glasses can succeed where others have failed. I like them. They don't look too bulky. Sean Wise wants to be one of the first Canadians to buy Focals, a new brand of smart glasses. My question would be, does the holographic image then appear outside of this? A tiny projector on the arm of the glasses sends images to the right lens, emails, texts, maps, weather and more. The Canadian company behind the product believes it's destined to be an international bestseller. The opportunity for this is really you know, a, a global kind of mass market opportunity. We see it as the, the next uh, step in the evolution of, of consumer technology. But we've seen smart glasses before. Swipe down anywhere to go back to the timeline. Google introduced a product called Glass in 2012 and quickly became the butt of jokes. I'm watching videos of idiots wearing these glasses and not paying attention to the world around them. Another problem, the product didn't look cool. Really was associated with geek culture very quickly. This technology expert says there's huge money to be made for the company that gets it right. In my view, in terms of wearable computing and wearable technology, smart glasses are the holy grail. Whatever company can get um, consumers to buy and use smart glasses will really make it. At head office in Kitchener, the Focals product has been in development for five years, based in part on learning from others' mistakes. The company has attracted $140 million in investment from heavy hitters like Amazon and Intel, who see the potential. It also lets you stay kind of heads up um, and present in the world around you and, you know, not be that person who's walking down the street with their, their head buried in their phone and almost gets hit by a car because they're just so distracted. What can I do with this? Time for a demonstration. I'm going to just simulate you getting some, some <laughs> messages here. Oh, text show up right from your phone. I'm reading from my glasses there you go. here. So there's a microphone um, in here somewhere too. Exactly, there's a, a microphone in there and so you know you're not going to compose a long email or anything like this on it but if mm -hmm. it's like hey running 15 minutes late see you shortly you could just send that quickly and, and fire that off. The and there's no camera. There's clear value from a use case perspective of having a camera and smart glasses but there's mm -hmm. also obviously a ton of privacy concerns and, and social implications. Got a bunch of frames on Friday. Privacy concerns could be a stumbling block for Focals. We live in a data sphere that's using our data as a commodity, right? So the privacy implications haven't been explored yet with this new product. We don't know much about it, what that will be like. Oh, now I'm starting to see it. For now, though, the biggest issue is getting more than just tech aficionados like Sean Wise to spend $1,300 on yet another smart gadget. Diane Buckner, CBC News, Toronto. Hmm. Okay, uh, up next on The National, it's a prescription drug that changed lives, but it was also the most expensive drug ever sold. Did they tell you how much they were going to charge? No, no, I learned that first from, from he reading about it uh, as it became public. No, I, I did not know what they were gonna charge. We take an in-depth look at Glybera, from its discovery to its downfall. That's next, but first. In case you missed it, Canadian Lily Singh is the latest YouTuber to take a break. I'm gonna be real with y'all. I am mentally, physically, emotionally, and spiritually exhausted. Singh, who goes by Superwoman, is known for her comedy skit videos. What am I going to, girl? Superwoman! But after seven years, she says she no longer understands the platform that made her famous. And she isn't the only one burning out. I will be putting my mental health first for a bit. I need to take a break from this channel. We're gonna need to go away for a little while. YouTube says it supports Singh's decision and acknowledges the stress YouTubers face. It even released a series of videos suggesting stars unplug from time to time. But for now, Singh's 14 million subscribers will just have to wait. It was a Canadian medical breakthrough called Glybera, a drug to treat a rare, often debilitating genetic disorder. The team behind it believed it could save lives, but patients who want it can't get it. Kelly Crow now on the million dollar medicine that just couldn't make it to market. 
These are some of the last remaining vials of what was a life-changing drug, a made-in-Canada medical breakthrough called Glybera. It was the world's first gene therapy, the first drug on the market that could fix a faulty gene. It offered new hope for people who suffer from a rare and potentially deadly genetic disorder. It was a turning point in my life. Cynthia Turcott was born with a genetic mutation called lipoprotein lipase deficiency, or LPLD. Her blood becomes thick with fat particles, triggering painful and dangerous attacks of pancreatitis. There was no treatment before Glybera. But after just two years on the market, Glybera is gone. How did you feel about that? Disappointed, of course. I would like to have seen this go all the way and seen this uh, uh, bring benefit to patients everywhere in the world. But it didn't. This is the story of an unsung Canadian scientific achievement, a world first ultimately defeated by the harsh realities of the pharmaceutical industry. The Glybera story started more than 30 years ago in a publicly funded laboratory at the University of British Columbia. In the early days of gene research, Dr. Michael Hayden was a pioneer determined to find a cure for patients suffering unbearable abdominal pain. Each time going back to the patient and hearing their stories, you, that just keeps you going. You just have to go to a clinic and hear what the patient tells you about the episode of abdominal pain. They couldn't have a single normal meal in their lives. In a healthy person, the LPL protein breaks down dietary fat into small particles so it can be used to fuel the body's activities. But about three out of every million people are born with a defective LPL gene. The fat doesn't break down, and their blood becomes so thick, it turns white. So it comes out of the body looking like that? Yep. It does come out of the body, but you see it better if you have it standing in a fridge overnight. And then what sits on top looks like cream, white as cream and white as the fridge itself. John Castellan was a young doctor from Amsterdam when he first joined Hayden's team in the late 1980s. Hayden's first assignment for Castellan? To find the gene that makes the LPL protein. It wasn't going to be easy. At the time, the techniques for then finding the gene that belongs to the protein were in its infancy. It took two years, but they found it, using the DNA of a patient who had a severe mutation. We found, indeed, in a gene, a big fault. Actually, a hole. There was a whole hole in the gene. This was a very happy, happy uh, and a, special day, yeah. uh, and we knew we had something. A good day. Their eureka moment was captured in this photograph. Everybody was uh, really thrilled, thrilled. We knew we had it at that moment. Now that they'd found the defective gene, could they fix it? I have to give all the credit to Michael. He started to think about gene therapy. We know they've got a defective gene, the one way to treat this would be to replace the gene. I mean, it was a fairly simple concept. But the problem is, how do you deliver that gene? And how do you get it into the blood? They decided to use a harmless virus, specially designed to deliver the new gene into the body. The first tests were in mice. The stunning results made the cover of this medical journal, showing how, day by day, the white, fat-laden blood turned red. That was an amazing moment, and you just saw it. You, when you withdrew blood, in the first, it's like milk. And then you take it a week later, it's lighter. You take it a week later, it's lighter. You take it eight weeks later, and it's completely clear. We've got it. You've, you, you knew you had it then. Then, through sheer luck, the UBC team found the same genetic mutation in a colony of cats from New Zealand. When the drug cured the cats, it was time to test it on humans. But that takes lots of money. It's called the Valley of Death, that moment when a scientific discovery makes the treacherous journey from the lab to the marketplace. That's when the investors, the business experts, and the marketing specialists step in to pay for clinical trials, manufacturing, and licensing costs. It's the only way a scientific discovery ever gets to patients, because universities don't make drugs.
So Castellan returned to Amsterdam and formed a drug company to develop the treatment that would be called Glybera. So we took over all the science, the mice science, the cat science, the virus science. Back in Vancouver, Hayden's team continued to provide lab support for the Dutch company. And in Holland, the first clinical trials were an immediate success. Within an hour, all the patients could walk and they never had any side effects at all from the therapy. But to get government approval, they needed more human trials. So they returned to the one place in the world with the highest prevalence of the disease, and that's here in Canada, along Quebec's Saguenay River. At a special lipid clinic in Chicoutimi, doctors began testing Glybera on LPLD patients who live in the area, where a gene mutation from a single ancestor has been passed down through the generations. Cynthia Turcott's parents both carried the mutation, but they didn't know it until their infant daughter almost died. I was um, eight months old and uh, I had um, some pain and I was vomiting and my mother was very panicking. We saw that on the, in the blood sample there was some part was uh, white, like cream, and was like, oh, and they panicked. They said to my mother, I had 24 hours to live. The doctors saved her life by starving her until her fat levels dropped. But she was told she could never eat chocolate or ice cream or hot dogs or milk and forget about beer or wine and a normal social life. The worst part was when she was told she could never have children. I was uh, in shock. I was grieving. I had to go to, to uh, I'm a psychologist, I had to go to, uh, to psychotherapy to, to deal with it. Then, at 22, she was stricken with a dreaded attack of pancreatitis. When she heard about the clinical trials happening in Shikudami, Turcotte immediately volunteered. So I, I said, yeah, I want to go there, I want to have it. Turcotte had no way of knowing then that she would be one of the few patients in the world ever to receive the life-changing drug. Back in Amsterdam, the drug company spent years trying to convince Europe's health regulators to approve it. And there was a lot of fighting and the politics, very unpleasant. Over the years it took to win that approval, the company lost millions. It was liquidated. A new company took over, called Unicure. It partnered with an Italian firm to finally get Glybera on the market. When the drug went on sale, it made headlines. Because not only was it the world's first gene therapy, it had also become the world's most expensive drug. The price? Around $1 million for the one-time treatment. Did they tell you how much they were going to charge? No, no. I learned that first from, from he reading about it uh, as it became public. No, I, I did not know what they were going to charge. Back in Vancouver, Hayden was not involved with the new company. He and UBC had signed over their patents long ago and moved on to other research. Hayden would get no money from the sale of Glybera, and he had nothing to do with setting the price. To be quite frank, this was not something I was particularly proud of, uh, that the pricing of this made this out of the reach of patient, the very patients, and the whole motivation for doing this was to have this available for patients. The problem is, is also that people like me and Michael, we never have anything to say about pricing. You know, by the time that there's a pricing, we are, we are gone already because it's, we, we've done the science and the clinical work and everything. And then it's the commercial and the financial people who determine the price. Why did Glybera cost so much? A Unicure official told us the million dollar price was based on a business calculation. Because other drugs for rare diseases can cost several hundred thousand dollars a year, every year, for life. By comparison, Glybera, with a one-time cost of a million dollars, seemed reasonable, especially since it was the only drug that could treat LPLD. And for that price, uh, obviously, it was almost impossible to sell it. In the end, there was only one customer. A German doctor prescribed it for this woman. It changed her life and stopped the potentially deadly pancreatitis attacks. With no other customers, Glybera was abandoned last fall. 
three remaining doses were given away for the bargain price of one euro each. Added up, the drug was given to only 31 people in the entire world, most treated free in the clinical trials. Cynthia Turcott is thrilled to be one of them. Because of Glybera, she was able to have two healthy children. Unicure officials told us there are no plans to revive Glybera or to apply for license in the U.S. or Canada. I have a hard time understanding why you're not angry that this drug that you developed didn't get used. I think I was angry at the time, but because this has taken so long, um, it kind of wears you out in a way. For the scientists, the discovery of Glybera is still a career highlight, an historic Canadian achievement that beat the odds. It did work, absolutely, yeah. yeah. So, so the patients that got it are still very happy. But in the harsh reality of the drug business, that's not enough. Kelly Crow, CBC News, Toronto. Up next on The National, we take a look at the confusion in the workplace now that marijuana is legal in Canada. Do you know what the workplace policy is on pot? Uh, not at the moment, no. Can I ask if you know what your workplace policy is on the use of pot, if you can no smoke? No idea. First, though, a new family portrait tonight to mark a milestone birthday. Prince Charles is turning 70. So tomorrow night on The National, Thomas Daigle will take us in for a closer look at the future king and his priorities for the throne. Here's a preview. Employment, education, and sustainability. All the prince's ingredients blend together in the Dumfries House kitchen. Today, they're prepping a meal for 600 guests. It's a colossal job, especially when dealing with royal demands. Just ask executive chef Tom Scoble. The prince is very concerned with, with uh, the sustainability. Uh, he obviously is as organic as we can, if we can. Um, and it is very important to him. That means those veggies come right from the property or nearby. And yes, that's local meat as well. We are live on the Pacific edition of The National and tracking some breaking news in Calgary. The city has voted against hosting the 2026 Olympics in a plebiscite. Here's what the mayor, Nahid Nenshi, had to say. We're all hoping for a yes vote tonight. But ultimately, the people have spoken. The no side celebrating with 56% of respondents saying the city should not host the games, 43% saying yes. This vote is not binding, but the mayor said next week council will likely vote to suspend the bid process. Well, it's been almost a month since recreational cannabis was legalized in this country, but there are still a lot of questions about how people can consume it, especially when it comes to their work. There is a patchwork of policies that companies are putting in place to make sure their employees stay safe and sober on the job. David Common gives us a look. Who knew legal pot would lead to more confused people? And that confusion, well, it rains high at work. Do you know what the workplace policy is on pot? Uh, not at the moment, no. Can I ask if you know what your workplace policy is on the use of pot, if you can smoke? No idea. Do you know if your work has a policy? I think they do. But you just don't know what it is? No. Even the police are inconsistent. The Toronto Force says officers can't use for 28 days before duty. Calgary's service says they can't at all, ever. While the OPP in Ontario say 24 hours from getting high to going on calls, it's just fine. Are uh, they allowed to smoke a joint before they come into work? What do you think the answer to that would be? Absolutely not. This session is full of HR managers from grocery and retail chains trying to figure out just what their policy should be and how to enforce it. Your supervisors, do they have any idea what they're looking for? Randy Dignard is the instructor. So play this out for me. I'm the employee, you're the employer, and you suspect I'm high, maybe I'm in a safety sensitive job, you're concerned about me, what do you do? First thing is, is I'm gonna, I have to investigate and I'm gonna look at, I'm looking at these, these key factors. I'm looking at the way you're dressed. I'm looking at the way your, your, your speech is. Yeah. I'm looking at your eyes. 
right? And if I'm sitting there going, you know what, I think you're impaired, then you see that, that the police doing the, 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 the you know, the, the, the one-legged walk, the, yep. the thing there, I might go to that route there, uh, right? And can you as an employer actually ask an employee to do that yes, without any can. legal problem? Yes, no? I have a right as an employer to, to determine whether you're safe to work. That's also true at safety sensitive jobs. Those who drive to sales calls or work with machinery. I don't start your day with a joint. <laughs> It comes down to common sense for these scaffolding workers, but recognizing impairment of any kind is a bit more complex for their bosses. How do you approach employees about whether or not they are a recreational cannabis user? You can't just come out and ask, do you use cannabis? It doesn't work that way. Charles Maynard runs Armor Equipment. A year before legalization, he started asking how to train his workers, but there wasn't much info available then. Employees do not have the right to use, possess, sell, or be impaired by it in the workplace. Now, all of them are starting a new online course to make it clear what is acceptable and what's not. I can honestly say that uh, most companies are taking one or two stances. It is the either zero tolerance, which works as far as making sure nobody's impaired. However, it has some human rights issues attached to that. And the second stance is, We'll wait and see what happens and kind of follow the leaders. Um, that can end you in hot water really quick as well. Take the airlines. Both WestJet and Air Canada have told their pilots no cannabis use 28 days before flying. But how would they know? Cannabis can stay in your system that long, though only in some people. And no test can determine when you last consumed. Banning use, well, that's, legally speaking, likely to be challenged in court. This is basically what I call it my office. Yeah. Uh, you have to take a firm stand at times. And Cab driver Sam al Khatib has another kind of worry. The effect that those who want to smoke or have just smoked may have on him. It's legal for them, but it's not legal for me. I have to be alert and ready to drive. And whatever they do, if they smoke themselves, it affects me, it's secondhand smoke. So I'm inhaling it, it will affect me, it will impair me actually. So that's called hot boxing. And Sam plans to tell his customers just no smoking of any kind. The whole definition of fit for duty means that you need to be physically, mentally, and emotionally in the right frame of mind to be able to perform your job. Jeff so Bradshaw is training Sam and his fellow cab drivers. He runs Fit for Duty, an online program for employers and employees. He confirms what we found that many companies still aren't prepared even though legalization has arrived. I think a lot of companies are going to make mistakes because they're going to have managers, uh, supervisors who are maybe reacting to a situation with not having the proper education or training, which could cause lawsuits, which could cause potential incidences if it's not dealt with properly. So that is the challenge now, new territory for employers and for many of them, it's still an unknown. David Coleman, CBC News, Calgary. Now, with so much confusion out there, we thought we'd try to get you more answers. So David Common will be live tomorrow at noon Eastern on the Nationals' Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter pages, where he'll put your questions to a workplace safety expert. So make sure you tune in and join the conversation. get behind a truck because everything's on fire around us on both yeah, sides. Oh my god. Oh my god. Oh my god, I can't even see. It's so smoky. Even with the video, hard to comprehend what thousands have dealt with as they left paradise in Northern California driving through the smoke and fire, desperately trying to make it to safety. We've been bringing many of those first-hand accounts uh, to you over the last few days, but tonight we want to hear from a family after the drive out. Their harrowing journey is our moment. We got a report from a passerby that about uh, half a mile away from our house, 
uh, house that was on fire. We parked our vehicles in the middle of a large, open, grassy area without trees, and we thought we were we, we thought we would stay there until we saw it coming toward the lookout point. About. A thousand feet from us, uh, we see the fire heading towards a house and we watch it attack this house and consume this house. So at that point, we went down the cliff. And I said to Zeta, once we commit to that, we're uh, dead meat if the fire gets to us. We uh, are thankful that uh, we were directed to flee that those flames and uh, see another sunrise. It's great to be alive. You know, Andrew, I know people who are watching who were in Slave Lake and Fort McMurray escaping those fires uh, can definitely relate to that. But for most of us, certainly for me, I've never had an experience like that. And I think it's so easy to dismiss what's happening in California as well. Just the latest wildfire, just another wildfire. But when you hear people tell their stories and you see that video, it is extraordinary. Yeah, and I mean, my, my heart goes out to, I mean, obviously anyone who's, who's lost in, in that fire, but also people who have to make the decision, right? Do, do, do you stay or do you go? You know, I, I'm sure there are people out there who think it's an easy call. Of course, you know, you flee to safety, possessions are just possessions, but when everything you've spent your life working on is on the line, uh, boy, that can't be an easy call. That is The National for this November 13th. Thanks for joining us. Good night. Good night.